All right, euthanasia and assisted suicide. Now, this is a very complex topic. Um, I, I'm preaching this because I want to share with you my thoughts because I've been, just been thinking about this really deeply and it was hard for me to think about any other topic. But my, my views and my arguments are somewhat like 99% formulated. So the idea of today's sermon, it's just going to be sharing like my imperfect thoughts on the subject and where I'm at it, where I'm at at the moment, just because it's something I've been thinking about a lot lately, almost to the point of obsession. So it's like I, I, I've just been thinking about it and I just couldn't stop thinking about it. So I, I thought, hey, for the stuff I've learned, uh, I will share that with you guys today. Uh, so I've been thinking about it a lot because I had a lot of unanswered questions. Um, it's like, you know, most of us here, I would say, would be against euthanasia. That would just be your natural inclination, right? I've got to say, oh, it's course, it's course, wrong. It sounds like it's wrong to kill somebody. But then you know of situations where you're kind of like, oh, that's a, it's a bit of a tough situation, right? Or that objection or this objection. So I want to just talk about those situations, talk a bit about what I think the Bible teaches on it, some situations of suicide in the Bible, and uh, just talk about the objections as well. Maybe give you my thoughts on how uh, you can sort of reason your way uh, when it comes to the topic of euthanasia and assisted suicide. So this is going to be my current position, what I've arrived at from you know, my musings, and hopefully it answers questions for you, but if it raises more questions, then I guess that'll just serve as a good, you know, sharpening of one another as we talk about it in church and that's you know it's funny because I I was talking with John just a couple of nights or a couple of nights ago I think and you know it's good when we discuss things in church and you know we can go forth on ideas and different uh, objections and arguments and whatnot because if we have the discussion here uh, and you hear the different points of view and people can disagree and talk about things then when you go out into the world and you have your views formulated, you would have already had that sort of practice as well uh, before you know, taking a stronger stand with people where, where the, you may only get one opportunity to talk with them. So I think it is great that our church talks about these things and I'm, I'm all uh, for people uh, talking and reasoning through this so that we can sharpen our views on a topic as, you know, as is, is quite, you know, it's, quite, it's quite a controversial and quite an emotive topic when it comes to euthanasia and assisted suicide. And that's why you know, people will protest and rally over things of social consequence, but ne not necessarily economic consequence, because things of social consequence can be very emotional and personal for people. Okay, so euthanasia and assisted suicide. Now, first of all, what is suicide? Obviously, this is quite straightforward, but suicide is when you murder yourself, according to the Bible. Right? When you murder, you, you basically kill yourself. And why is it murder? Because if you do not deserve murder yourself, and obviously you don't have the authority to kill somebody, suicide is when you murder yourself. Now, some people ask the question, well, if I commit suicide, does that send me to hell? And if you believe on Jesus Christ, nothing can send you to hell because we believe once saved, always saved. It's eternal life. But some people believe it because maybe they have a Catholic mentality where the Catholic mentality is, well, if I sin, I need to go and ask, you know, confession and get forgiveness for that sin. So how, how can I get forgiveness for a sin when I'm no longer alive after I commit that sin? So there's no opportunity to get forgiveness. Um, also, another way you can think of it is, well, if you think, oh, you know, how does it work with eternal life? How does it work if I'm always saved? Well, when, when, you, when you kill somebody else, right, if you were to murder somebody else, do you murder their body or do you murder their soul? You say, well, I don't murder their soul, I murder their body. In fact, in Matthew 10, Jesus tells us, Fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. So notice when you shoot somebody, or if you shoot somebody, you're only killing their body, you can't kill their soul. So why would it be different if you turn that gun on yourself and kill yourself? You're not going to kill, you, you'll kill your body, but you're not going to kill your soul. So, you know, yes. If somebody commits suicide and they're saved, will they still go to heaven? Yes, they will go to heaven. And in fact, for those people who believe in eternal security and they go through hard times, because people commit suicide for all different reasons. We'll look at some reasons in the Bible for why people commit suicide. But it, in the Bible, you know, it doesn't cover every scenario. Every, people have different reasons why they become depressed and people, different reasons why they, they they come to the conclusion in their own life why their life is no longer worth living. Obviously, their life is always worth living. That's the, the Bible's view on life. 
But obviously people come to these conclusions, unfortunately, and it's tragic when somebody who, you know, is not worthy of death, you know, they're not worthy of, you know, capital punishment and because they haven't done anything worthy of capital punishment when they kill themselves, you know. So it's something that's obviously a sin. It's not something people should be doing. And it is tragic when people take their own life. Um, but sometimes people will say, well, if you're saved, you know, why would you ever take your life? But you got to understand, I think sometimes if, if, you, if you know that you're going to go straight to heaven when you commit suicide, you can imagine how that could be an even greater incentive for somebody to take their life if they're suffering. So, you know, don't get this mindset. I'm just saying, I'm not saying obviously people should commit suicide. What I'm saying is I want you guys to understand that it's not so crazy when people commit suicide. Sometimes people go through things that you have never experienced. So it can be, uh, you know, we can have compassion on people that do. Now, should they? Of course not. Is their life still worth living? Can they overcome it? Yes, they can. But this idea that if you're saved, you'll never commit suicide, I think is not actually rational. Because if you're rational and you thought, well, if I die, I'll go to a better place, you'll, that would be an even greater incentive to, uh, to commit suicide. So. You don't go straight to hell. Uh, you don't go to hell just for committing suicide. It's no different to any other sin. And like I said, most people may think that because they think, well, how can you get forgiveness for something that you've just killed yourself for? Or they think, or they have this mindset that there are certain sins that are unforgivable. But obviously, suicide is not one of them. Now, let's look at different situations of suicide in the Bible. Now, suicide is a little bit different to euthanasia. So I'm just sharing some Bible with you because the Bible doesn't say too much about euthanasia, right? But it does, it does give some situations where people commit suicide. And I just thought it'd be interesting to go through some of the stories briefly so that you can get a, a little bit more Bible in today's sermon. And uh, maybe some of the stories that you're not so familiar, in with, familiar with in the Bible where people have committed suicide. Now, the first one is Ahithophel in 2 Samuel 17. The Bible says here, when Ahithophel saw that his counsel was not followed, he saddled his ass and arose and got him home to his house, to his city, and put his household in order and hanged himself and died and was buried in the sepulchre of his father. So you don't know who, who Ahithophel is. So Ahithophel lived at the time of David and he was one of David's closest counsel counselors. But when Absalom conspired against Ahithophel, Ahithophel decided to conspire with Absalom against David. And, and when David heard that Ahithophel was going to counsel against him, he prayed that God would make his counsel for naught. Because Ahithophel was actually a very well-respected counselor. And the Bible actually says about Ahithophel that his counsel was almost like you inquired at the mouth of God. You know, it's like that's how well-respected his counsel was. So what happened was when Absalom was deciding how to attack David, um, Ahithophel comes to him and says, you know what, we're going to get like 12,000 people and we're just going to go after David and just make sure David gets killed because if you don't, people are going to rise up. David's a man of war, like, you know, and then you're, you're eventually he's going to overtake you. But at the same time, Ahithophel's conspiring with Absalom. David sends a guy called like, I think his name was Hukai or something, Hulai. Um, and then he, 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 he's on David's side, but he's like a double agent, like giving Absalom counsel. So, so that guy, I can't remember exactly his name, it starts with an H, goes to him. So then the Absalom just asks counsel of Ahithophel and this other guy. Now Ahithophel actually gives him the right counsel if he wants to win that battle and win against David. But the guy that David sends, who's kind of like the double agent, tells him, no, no, you don't want to give you, just go after him. Like David's, you know, it's like David's not, not going to know, like David's not going to stay in the camp and to be that easy to kill. No, what you have to do is you have to wait, wait amass an army, go against them, that way you know David's in the fray kind of thing, and then go again, and then you're going to win. But see, Ahithophel knows that it's not that easy to defeat David. But because um, it was God's intention for Ahithophel's counsel to not be heeded, he sort of influenced Absalom to take the counsel of the other guy instead. So there's a few theories why Ahithophel decided after his counsel was not heeded, which is what it's talking about here why he then decided to just go home, put his house in order and then kill himself. Some people think it's because he, you know, he knew that um, uh, like Absalom was not going to win and whatnot. But for whatever reason, he knew that you know, he, he, after this battle, after this thing, that, that um, his life wasn't 
uh, going to be able to be livable anymore, something like that. But that's Ahithophel's story. Now, another story is in 1 Kings 16, which is Zimri. So we read here in verse 15, In the twenty and seventh year of Asa, king of Judah, did Zimri reign seven days in Terzah, and the people were encamped against Gibbethon, which belonged to the Philistines. And the people that were encamped heard say, Zimri hath conspired and hath also slain the king. Wherefore all Israel made Omri, the captain of the host, king of Israel that day in the camp. So again, this is a similar situation where there's a bit of treason happening. Zimri is like the captain of, um, I think, Baasha's sons, Elah, army. And then he conspires, right? He kills the rest of Baasha's house by killing it. And then he ends up reigning. Um, and then when they hear about this conspiracy, they make Omri, who's also a captain of Israel, king over Israel. And now they're going to go attack Zimri. And Omri went up from Gibbethon and all Israel with him and they besieged Terza. And it came to pass when Zimri saw that the city was taken. So now this, this army led now by Omri is attacking Zimri uh, inside this, is in this palace. The, the place is being overtaken and it says here that he went in, once he realized that the city was taken, that he went into the play, palace of the king's house and burnt the king's house over him with fire and died. So how did this guy commit suicide? He didn't hang himself. He actually burnt down the building that he was in and then he died within that building. For his sins which he sinned in doing evil in the sight of the Lord, in walking in the way of Jeroboam, and in his sin which he did to make Israel to sin. So that's the second one. The third one is a very famous one. We know about Judas Iscariot and obviously Judas Iscariot hung himself because he couldn't live with the guilt of betraying uh, the Son of God. Then Judas, which had, which had betrayed him, when he saw that he was condemned, repented himself and brought again the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, I have sinned and that I have betrayed the innocent blood. And they said, what is that to us? See thou to that. And he cast down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went and hanged himself. Now Judas, I don't believe, is saved. I don't believe Judas went to, uh, to heaven. But it's not because he killed himself. So, you know, whether the people, you know, you know, you'd think Ahithophel was saved, you know, he just made a wrong decision and, and went against, uh, you know, the King David. Uh, Zimri, maybe you can say, hey, you know, he was a wicked person, maybe he wasn't saved. Uh, Judas obviously was a wicked person, you know, betrayed the Lord Jesus Christ. But whether they went to heaven or not, is not determined about how, was not, it was not determined by how they ended their life. So you just need to remember that, that these are just situations where people committed suicide, but it's, it's not necessarily what determined where they went when they died because it's faith on Jesus Christ that determines that. All right, Judges 16 uh, is the situation of Samson. Now, Samson, you could say this is committing suicide because he kind of knew that he was going to die, but you can say that it's a different situation as well because his sole intention was not to end his own life. He actually wanted to avenge uh, himself of the Philistines. He just decided to use a method where his life would die as well. So it is technically suicide because he was, I guess you could say it's technically suicide because he lost his life, but you could say maybe it's not exactly the same as suicide because the intention was something else and it just resulted in the loss of his life. But Judges 16 is where we read this story about Samson. It said, It came to pass when their hearts were merry that they said, Call for Samson that he may make a sport and they called for Samson out of the prison house and he made them sport and they set him between the pillars. And Samson said unto the lad that held him by the hand, Suffer me that I may feel the pillars whereupon the house standeth that I may lean upon them. So if you don't know the story of Samson very well, this is at the point where Samson, you know, he's already been caught by the Philistines and they've, take, they've plucked out his eyes and he's grinding at the millstone and things like that. So they're just using him for entertainment and whatnot. So this is why he's asking the young lad to guide him because he can't see anymore. He doesn't have his eyes. And he says to the young lad, you know, tell me like where the pillars are that hold up this place because I just want to rest and lean up against them, right? Uh, so then he says here, verse 27, Now the house was full of men and women and all the lords of the Philistines were there. And there were upon the roof about 3,000 men and women that beheld while Samson made sport. And Samson called unto the Lord and said, O Lord God, remember me, I pray thee, and strengthen me, I pray thee, only this once, O God, that I may be at once avenged of the Philistines for my two eyes. 
and Samson took hold of the two middle pillars upon which the house stood and on which it was borne up of the one with his right hand and of the other with his left. And Samson said, let me die with the Philistines. And he bowed himself with all his might. All right, so he's pushing the pillars out. And the house fell upon the lords and upon all the people that were therein. So, that, so the dead which he slew at his death were more than they which he slew in his life. All right, so what it's saying there is Samson killed more people when he pushed those pillars out than he had killed you know, when he had battled the Philistines prior and did all these other antics that he got up to. I won't go too much into that story. So, I mean, Samson would be an example. We would assume that Samson is in heaven. I mean, he's in the hall of faith and all that sort of stuff, right? So, you know, but yet, yet he took his life, you know, in, in the sense that he pushed the pillars off and it caused him to die. And yet he is in heaven. So you can see there that even if you, somebody takes that, that unfortunate step, they can still be saved. Now, 1 Samuel 31 is where we started uh, this, this, um, this sermon and this is the story of Saul so I won't I won't read it just for sake of time but the story of Saul if you didn't catch it when we were reading through it is basically he's in battle and this is the battle where he was told not to go fight but he decided to go fight anyway um, and then in this in this battle um, he was hit by archers and he's about to die so he tells his armor bearer to basically kill him now so I, I think this is very uh, very relevant to the topic because this is probably the closest situation to euthanasia I think in the Bible where uh, there are two there are two instances in the Bible where somebody is actually requesting to be killed before their natural life ends based on you know the, the, the situation that they find themselves in which is a battle here so his life may be slowly ending but who knows you don't know what might have happened if he had been taken by the Philistines you know would they have patched up his sores kept him alive who knows could he have gotten out we don't know but here, because his armor bearer won't kill him, and we don't know whether the armor bearer was sore afraid because he was afraid to kill the king, like David says to the other, to the Amalekite, why were you not afraid to stretch forth your hand and put your hand on the Lord's anointed? Or was he just afraid, you know, because of the situation and whatnot? You know, was he, was he also afraid, you know, maybe of, you know, what the Philistines were going to do to him and that just made him freeze up? We don't really know. But... Because the armor bearer is not willing to kill Saul, then Saul basically takes the sword and falls upon it. So that's how they would commit suicide with the sword. Like they'd lay their sword the other way and then they'd lie on it and it would go through their heart or something like that. Similar to you know, how somebody might take a gun and, and shoot themselves. So that's the situation here. Saul commits suicide, he takes his own life. When his armor bearer sees that he takes his own life, he also does the same thing. So an unfortunate end to uh, the man of God, Saul here, even though at this point in his life, he was already doing a lot of bad. He was doing a lot of damage. But we know that Saul is in heaven because when he, you know, talks to the witch at Endor, um, Samuel, and he talks to Samuel, Samuel actually says to him, you know, after he dies, you're going to be with, your, you and your sons are going to be with me. And obviously Samuel is in heaven. Samuel is not in hell. So this is how we know Saul was also saved, even though he blatantly took his life here, as opposed to Samson, who you know had an ulterior purpose for why he did what he did, and it just happened to take his life. Now, the last scenario I want to show you in the Bible, and I, I hope this sermon is not too negative. <laughs> I, you know, some, sometimes passages, you know, are not always as positive, but hopefully, you're learning some things here. So the last one is Judges 9, where it's Abimelech. So this is the story where Abimelech fights against um, another army. He's at a strong tower and a woman in the tower says here, there was a strong tower within the city and thither fled all the men and the women and all they of the city and shut it to them and got them up. So this is Abimelech coming, uh, got them up to the top of the tower. And Abimelech came unto the tower and fought against it and went hard unto the door of the tower to burn it with fire. So generally, the, the kings, are the people who want to preserve their life, don't go right all the way up into the heat of the battle, right? So you remember when Uriah died, you know, they said, oh, Uriah, they pushed him all the way up to the heat of the battle, and then they withdrew, and that's what killed him. The archers were able to shoot him. So here, this guy has gone, you, they're telling him he's gone all the way up, all the way hard up into the door of the tower, because he's trying to light this 
tower on fire to kill these people. And he says, a certain woman cast a piece of a millstone, so it's like a rock, right? She throws a rock down the tower and hits Abimelech in the head, so upon Abimelech's head, and all to break his skull. So obviously the people are trying to defend themselves, so this, this, one, this one lady throws a rock and hits him on the head. Then he called hastily unto the young man, his armor bearer, and said unto him, Draw thy sword and slay me, that men say not of me, a woman slew me. And his young man thrust him through and he died. So this guy wants to die because he doesn't want it recorded in history that a woman killed him. And ironically, God puts that story yeah. in the Bible, makes it very clear that a woman killed this man. Yeah. So that is the story of Abimelech. So his story and Saul's story are probably the most similar in the sense that, you know, their life had not naturally come to an end, but yet they asked somebody to end their life prematurely. Now let's get on to the main point of this sermon, which is, okay, well, what is, and I'm just uh, shortening it, uh, euthanasia and assisted suicide. Now, if, if you don't know what the word euthanasia means, uh, supposedly, you know, I think it's like some Greek word or something, and it means good death. So when people talk, the reason why they use the term euthanasia, it's like giving somebody a pleasant death rather than like a, a different sort of death. So that's what the word euthanasia means. Now, euthanasia can be voluntary or involuntary. Right? So you say, like, well, isn't it, how could involuntary euthanasia ever be you know, rational? Well, it's because if the person is, like, say, unconscious or they can't make decisions for themselves, somebody like a family member or the doctor in some instances might make that decision right? and, and put them to death. And that's what they'd call involuntary euthanasia. So voluntary euthanasia is when you have the person's consent but then somebody else administers the drug. So what's the difference between euthanasia and assisted suicide? They, they sort of differentiate between these two terms. You might think that they're the same thing, but it's not, it's not exactly the same. So euthanasia is, say, if somebody consents to die in a country that has it legal, and obviously my position is I don't think it should be legal, but euthanasia is if you want to die and then the doctor actually administers the drug. So the doctor is actually the one that's doing the killing. Assisted suicide, in some countries, they say, well, we want to make sure that there's consent. We want to make sure that the people that, <laughs> the people that ask to, to die are not coerced. So, so it's very hard to prove that they're not being coerced, but they want to say, we want to make sure to the best that we can that it was their consensual decision to take their own life. So assisted suicide is like somebody else loading the gun, but you have to pull the trigger. So it's like they'll prepare everything, you know, and you might have to press a computer saying, you know, if you press this button, you will die. Do you agree? You might have to say yes three times to make sure that there's consent. Or, you know, they may prepare like a solution for you to drink, but you have to drink it yourself. Nobody can inject it into you or make you drink it. So that's why there's a distinction between the two. Now, suicide obviously is when you have no guidance from somebody else, no coercion from somebody else, and you just take matters into your own hands. That's what suicide is. So, if you're wondering what those, those terms are, hopefully that gives you some more understanding and why they distinguish. Because you say, like, why do they sometimes call it physician-assisted physician dying, you know, PAD or PA, physician-assisted suicide, and why do sometimes they call it euthanasia? Well, that's the difference. Right. Um, <clears throat> what other terms? I think that's it in terms of that. Now, what does the Bible say about murder? And this is where I think the crux of the argument is for a Christian to decide, well, am I for euthanasia or am I against euthanasia? So after I talk about this, then I'll spend a significant amount of time talking through the objections. And sorry if I'm reading a lot of this, it's just because the, the, the logic is quite complicated. So I just, I've written it down here just to sort of talk through my thoughts. So hopefully I don't lose you, but hopefully it, it, makes, it makes it more understandable. Now, what does the Bible say about murder? Now, obviously murder is wrong. Right? Murder is when you take the life of an innocent person. Exodus 21, he that smiteth a man so that he die shall be surely put to death. Now somebody might say, well, what's the difference between capital punishment and euthanasia and assisted suicide? People say, like, how can you be against state-sanctioned killing 
when you're for capital punishment. So what people have to realize is, well, because capital punishment is for people that are guilty of a crime that is worthy of capital punishment. You know, there are different crimes in the Bible. Murder is one of them, where if you murder somebody, you're now worthy of capital punishment. Whereas euthanasia, when we're against euthanasia, we're saying that's murder because it's killing an innocent person. So if you understand that distinction, then you won't get tripped up with the argument of, or oh, why you as a Christian are for you know, capital punishment, or why are you against euthanasia, or you're for capital punishment. I'll say, well, isn't that inconsistent? Because you don't want the state to legalize killing in one area, but you're all right for the state to legalize killing in another area. So you need to understand the distinction there is because we're not against people that are being put to death that are worthy of being put to death, and the Bible outlines those sorts of crimes. We're against innocent people uh, being put to death. So murder is the killing of innocent life. So Deuteronomy 27, we see in verse 25, Cursed be he that taketh reward to slay an innocent person, and all the people shall say, Amen. Proverbs 6, These six things doth the Lord hate, yea, seven are an abomination unto him, a proud look, a lying tongue, look at this, and hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that deviseth wicked imaginations, feet, feet that be swift in, in running to mischief, a false witness that speaketh lies, and he that soweth discord among brethren. So these are good things to take note of what, the good, of God, what God hates, right? Make sure you don't do them. Now, this is where I think the crux of the argument is for a believer, right? And where I sort of, myself, was sort of struggling with getting my head around these arguments is where, where I'm trying to think in my own mind is, I was thinking, well, if somebody, is, if somebody, like obviously it's wrong to kill another person. Um, and, and we know it's a sin to murder yourself even though there are no laws against it, right? There's no technically law to stop you from killing yourself. And we think, well, why is it wrong to kill another person? Well, according to the Bible, it's wrong to kill another person if they're innocent. But where I sort of was getting a bit mixed up in my own mind, and maybe you have as well, is you say, well, well, but what if you have the consent of the person? Like, what if the person gives you consent to kill them? Are you still murdering them? Because you may think, well, murder is when somebody consent, doesn't consent to you taking their life and therefore you're committing murder because not only are they innocent but they, they, they did not give you the, the, the permission to take their life. So if they give the permission, is that different? And this is where I think the crux of the argument is because in the Bible I believe that even if a person is innocent, or even if a person's innocent, even if they give you consent, that would still be considered murder because you are taking the life of an innocent person. And I think this, this is where if, in, the, in, in a biblical sense, where the crux of the argument is. Because if, even if you have the consent of a person, it's still murder. Therefore, according to the Bible, euthanasia would be wrong, even if you have the consent of the person. Right? Now, if we go to 2 Samuel 1, and we recap the story of Saul, this is where I think it gives us a bit of a precedent, or a common law, if you will, of a king making a judgment of somebody that gave consent to their death and yet was still considered guilty of murder in 2 Samuel 1. This is why I think this story of Saul is very relevant to euthanasia. Now you might wonder, if you just read 2 Samuel 1 and didn't realize what happened in 1 Samuel 31, you may think that there's a contradiction in the Bible because how did Saul die? So you need to understand in, in 1 Samuel 31 is the actual story of how Saul died. Right? He, he, he was shot by archers in the battle and he, was, he was, thought he was dying. Right, He didn't want to get captured by the Philistines. He didn't want to be abused by them. Asked the armor bearer to kill him. He wouldn't, so he fell upon his own sword. Now in 2 Samuel 1, we're not getting the true account of Saul's death. What we are getting is the Amalekite story to David. And we learn in 2 Samuel chapter 4, I believe it is, where David actually says when somebody else comes to him, and tells him that he had murdered, that they had murdered supposedly what they believe was David enemies in their bed to get, gain favor with David. David actually refers to this story and says, you know what, this, this Amalekite came to me and thought that he was going to get rewarded by telling me he had slain Saul, and now you've killed innocent people in their bed. <laughs> Not even somebody that was dying, and you think I'm going to reward you? 
So what, how does this story go here? So the Amalekite comes to David, um, and, and David basically asked him, where did you come from in verse 3? And he said, out of the camp of Israel am I escaped. David said unto him, how went the matter, I pray thee, tell me. And he answered, that the people have fled from the battle. So then he recounts the story saying that, they, that they've lost the battle. Then he comes across Saul. So this guy's an Amalekite. So supposedly he's from the people that they were fighting, right? And the young man that told him said, As I happened by chance upon Mount Gilboa, verse 6, behold, Saul leaned upon his spear. So you can already see there that he's, he's retelling a story that isn't entirely true, right? Because obviously he, was, uh, he wasn't leaning upon his spear. And lo, the chariots and horsemen followed hard after him. And when he looked behind him, he saw me and called unto me and answered, and I answered, here am I. And he said unto me, who art thou? And I answered him, I am an Amalekite. And he said unto me again, stand, I pray thee upon me and slay me for anguish has come upon me because my life is yet whole in me. So this is where I think, well, here's the situation where Saul actually gave consent. He's saying, I want you to kill me. So the guy then kills him, the Amalekite. But then how does David react to the Amalekite admitting that he killed Saul even with his consent? He says here, and David said to the young man, verse 13, that told him, where are you from? He says he's an Amalekite. And David said unto him, how wast thou not afraid to stretch forth thine hand to destroy the Lord's anointed? And David called one of the young men and said, Go near and fall upon him. And he smote him that he died. And David said unto him, Thy blood be upon thy head, for thy mouth hath testified against thee, saying, I have slain the Lord's anointed. So I think that's the closest precedent you can get in the Bible to say, well, here's somebody. We obviously know murder is wrong. If murder is the taking of innocent life, even with consent, we have the situation here where Saul gives consent to the Amalekite to kill him, you know, according to the story told to David. And yet, even on that information, David judges that that man is worthy of death because he has murdered somebody, even though that person gave him consent. Now, let's think about some objections, right? Oh, one last point before I get onto objections is, so this is the crux of the matter, right? It's sort of, what should be our attitude towards taking somebody's life even if you have consent right so somebody would say you know we, we tend to think about it in medical terms and what tends to muddy the waters is because when it starts getting to the end of life right and things start getting a bit harder and whatnot people start to compromise on their principles but if the principle is it's never right to take an innocent life you know we can talk about suffering and whatnot and we can see that people generally are not even consistent when it comes to suffering but what should be our mindset we think about the suffering elderly person or the disabled person that no longer wants to live and we're going to give them a peaceful death you know with euthanasia but the principle you can think of the same is if if somebody who is disabled is on a bridge and they're wanting to commit suicide you know they can't do it themselves they tell you i want to commit suicide now, what should our response be in terms of lawfully? Should it be, should, it, should the law encourage people to go, no, talk that person out of it. Like, get, you know, get off the bridge. You know, your life is still worth living. You know, you still have time left. You don't know whether you're going to die. You know, how you can impact other people's lives. Or should the response be if somebody gives consent that you pick that person up out of their wheelchair and you throw them over the bridge? You know, so that's, that's one impact of what will happen is if, euthanasia is legalized right that, that it basically will say well that is fine to do should it be fine to do would it still be considered murder should it still be considered murder even if that person gives consent you know is your responsibility to society to talk people out of taking their own life so that's one area where i'm thinking if murder is murder even with consent then assisted suicide would be wrong still and I think we have a situation here where somebody has consent and yet they are still judged as being a murderer by King David now that's 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 it for verses let me just talk through some objections and um, some reasoning around it now one objection might be that somebody says well when it comes to euthanasia you know I have the choice because I have the right to bodily autonomy 
right? And they say, well, you know, just like you can't force me to, to live a certain way, you can't force me to be alive. You know, so I should be able to take my own life. Now, most people that are pro-euthanasia are not consistent in this area because if the principle is I have the right to bodily autonomy, most euthanasia advocates would say you can only, we only want to legalize euthanasia for the terminally ill and the, you know, the, the people that are right at the end of their life and everything like that. But if the, if the principle for why you should be able to end your life is you have the right to bodily autonomy, then why, why do you have to be terminally ill to exercise that right? Yeah, and, and most people are, would be against young people committing suicide, you know, just people that are just disabled committing suicide. They'd say, no, we don't want to legalize that. But if they were consistent, if they were consistent with that principle that you have a right that the government cannot infringe upon to take your own life, whether you're terminally ill or not, that, you know, it, th that situation doesn't mean you have the right and if you're healthy, you no longer have the right. So if somebody's healthy, yet they're just depressed or they don't want to live life because they just think, oh, the next 60 years is going to be hell, what's the point of going through the trouble? I may as well take my life. Mm -hmm. Technically, on that principle, they have to concede that point and they should be able to take their life there as well. So you have to understand, like people keep brushing off the slippery slope argument. Right? And the slippery slope argument, they argue against it, as I understand, because they say, well, just because I believe it's right to commit suicide when you're terminally ill, that doesn't necessarily mean you must legalize, um, you know, legalizing assisted suicide when you're not terminally ill. But the reason why people understand that a slippery slope happens because the same reasoning that you use to justify uh, assisted suicide or euthanasia when you're terminally ill can equally be used to justify why you can use assisted suicide or legalize assisted suicide when you are not terminally ill. So if they, can, if they use that argument to say, well, you have the right to bodily autonomy, then they have to concede the point that there should be no safeguards. Right? There shouldn't be any reason why you can't take your own life because you have the right to bodily autonomy. No matter what situation you're in, you should be able to exercise that right. So the people that are arguing for euthanasia and assisted suicide, if they're consistent, they will be the type of person that says there should be no safeguards. People have the right. So those people on that extreme side are actually being consistent with that principle. And the people that aren't being consistent with that principle and just think it's about you know, alleviating suffering and whatnot, they will say, well, that's why it's just for that end of life scenario. Now, another objection is well, they'll say suicide isn't illegal. So you say, well, how does it make sense if suicide isn't illegal? What other activity, act, action is there when what you're doing is not illegal, but yet it's illegal to help somebody do that? So you, you see that sort of mix up in logic there where they sort of say, well, it's logical if you, if you think about it in one way. You say, well, if it's not illegal for me to do something, because technically it's not illegal for you, for you to commit suicide. There's no law against committing suicide. And if somebody tries to commit suicide, they're not criminally punished at all. So then they make the argument, well, if it's not illegal, why should it be illegal for somebody to help me to commit suicide? Now, there's no law forbidding suicide, not because the law wants to say you have a right to die in the sense that they don't, they're not saying you have a right to... Um, it, it's... Because think about it this way, right? You have, you, have a, you have a right to your own body in the sense that not, nobody can stop you from taking your own life. But when we talk about euthanasia and assisted suicide, we're not really talking about whether you are able to take your own life. What we are talking about is whether somebody should be able to help you take your own life, right? Because if you do it on your own, not, no law can ever stop that. No law can protect you from yourself. But what the law is trying to discourage is whether somebody can help you or coerce you or guide you as to how to do it. That is what is being debated. So the law can't completely prevent you from killing yourself, but it ought to forbid one person taking the life of another innocent person. So. A side effect of making 
euthanasia or making assisted suicide illegal is it makes it more difficult for somebody who wants to commit suicide to be able to do it because now they're on their own, right? They have to do it on their own, right? That's the side effect of it. Now, it's not illegal to commit suicide because a criminal punishment for suicide wouldn't make sense. So you say, why isn't it, if suicide is also murder, why isn't it illegal? Well, see, it wouldn't make sense to make suicide illegal because why is somebody wanting to commit suicide? They want to commit suicide because they think their life is not worth living. Now, if you make their life even worse by putting a criminal punishment on it, how is that encouraging them not to commit suicide? It's like encouraging them to commit suicide even more because it's making their life even worse. So it's not illegal because a criminal punishment for suicide wouldn't make sense. Now, laws that are designed to prevent harm to yourself, they exist because we have a socialized healthcare system. So you say, well, why? There are other laws out there that stop you from harming yourself. But the reason why, for example, the government tells you not to speed or the government tells you to put a helmet on is because we have a socialized healthcare system. Because if you then go out and hurt yourself, somebody has to take care of the damage that you've just done to yourself. But notice there, it's different to me committing suicide because generally the, the reason why the government stops you from doing things is they're stopping you from doing things that will bring a benefit to your life. Like you're trying to enhance your life by being entertained or you know, doing something that you'd like to do that the government's stopping you from doing. But nobody does things in order to end their life, right? They do things that get them in trouble and then the government has to then come and try and save their life by providing them health care. So these restrictions that the government puts on you are generally activities that you believe will enhance your life but may have health risks. But punishing someone for attempting to take their own life, like I said, it would only encourage them to want to do that more. So it's not actually going to help them. So this is why suicide is not legal. It's not legal not because it's saying, hey, it's something that you should do. You know, it's something that should be helped to do. It's not legal because it wouldn't make sense if they punished suicide. So you can see that there's sort of a switch there in that logic. When somebody says, well, why is it legal for me to commit suicide, but illegal for somebody to help? Because, like I said, it's because it's not logical for the, for the government to punish suicide. But the reason why assisting somebody to commit suicide is because the law is discouraging other people from taking an innocent life, even if the person gives consent, like we already talked about. Now, what's the difference? Here's another objection. They'll say, well, what's the difference between withholding medical assistance and euthanasia? They'll say, like, sometimes when you withhold medical assistance, you know that that's going to hasten a person's death. So what's the difference if you just hasten it actively? And some people define this as active euthanasia versus passive euthanasia, but um, I don't think that that's the best way to describe it, where they say active euthanasia is when you actually try and end a person's life, and passive euthanasia is when you refrain from doing something and that ends the person's life. Now, people that are against euthanasia dispute that it should be called passive euthanasia because they're saying the difference between withdrawing medical help and actually taking somebody's life is the intent of that treatment. Right, so it's like with abortion. Abortion should be distinguished between the intention to take the life of the baby and the intention, for example, to save the mother, which unfortunately results in losing the life of the baby, like in an ectopic pregnancy. So this is how you differentiate between the two when it comes to the difference between withholding a medical treatment and the difference between intentionally taking somebody's life. It's what was the intention of the treatment? Was the intention to treat the symptoms or to ease the suffering and unfortunately it resulted in somebody's hastening of their loss of life? Or was the intention to actually take the life? And that's where doctors will actually distinguish between that and this is why they're able to do the things that they do now and not be charged for murder because there's something called the doctrine of double effect. When you do something, yes, it has two effects where one is it may ease somebody's pain to the point where you render them unconscious and they're no longer able to eat and it's going to hasten their death. But it, the intention was not to kill the patient, the intention was to treat the symptoms and to treat the, treat the symptoms of the patient. And even though it has that double effect, 
it's not considered murder. So that's the difference between withholding medical treatment and euthanasia. It's about intent. The intent of the medical treatment is not to take human life. Um, like I said, it's similar to how we distinguish between abortion. There's the double, uh, the doctrine of double effect in medicine. And think about it, right? Death, killing somebody, taking their life, can never be considered a medical treatment. Which is what the, the pro-euthanasia people are trying to say is that, you know, well, you're helping them by taking their life. Now think about this. If, if taking somebody's life is a medical treatment, it'll be a really easy job to be a doctor, right? Yeah. I mean, just I solve all your problems. I'll just kill you. <laughs> Whatever your problem is, I just take your life and then that's it. Problem over. You know? So obviously, death is not a medical treatment. So then the question is, if it's not a medical treatment for somebody who is old and dying, then, or if it's not a medical treatment for somebody who's young, who's maybe suffering from depression or suffering from other medical ailment, why would it be a medical treatment when somebody is old? You know? So you, can, you can't come at it from, well, this is something compassionate for the doctors to do because doctors taking life goes against the, the, the fundamental relationship between doctor and patient, right? That's why when it comes to euthanasia, 95% of palliative care doctors, I've heard this statistic so many times in the debates, are against euthanasia because they understand that obviously you can't stop somebody from taking their own life because if somebody takes matters into their own hands, there's nothing you can do about it. But when it comes to euthanasia and assisted suicide, it's who's going to actually have to do it. It's the doctors that are actually going to have to do it. It's always put onto the medical doctors. Yeah. So the palliative doctors, they know, you know that prognosis is never 100%. Prognosis is how, many, how much time they give you to live. They know that people often want to die for other reasons and they can, they can alleviate those reasons. And 95% of them are against it because the relationship between a doctor and a patient is the doctor is trying to do everything they can to help the patient. But when you legalize assisted suicide, what does that do to the medical field? It means that now doctors have an out. You know, they can throw in the towel. They may not, you know, do everything in their power in order to alleviate the pain and suffering because they now have a way to get around that law, right? They, they, they can now do harm and it's legitimized. Now, another objection is somebody might say, well, you're forcing someone to suffer longer than is necessary, right? So they'll say, like, why make that person suffer longer than, is need to, than they need to? Now, a couple of thoughts there is, one is, if someone is starving, right, they don't have any food, you have no food to give them, but you refuse to kill them, are you forcing them to suffer? Is that, is that your fault? Are you making them suffer? Right, because they, they, you just don't have the means to end that suffering. So it's not that you're forcing them to suffer, it's that you refuse to take an innocent life. Right? So it's not, that, it's not that it's suffering. But even so, when I hear palliative doctors speak on this topic, generally they will say that there's, there's, there's nothing that palliative care cannot relieve, right? They say, because you can, you can relieve somebody of pain to the point where you actually sedate them and they no longer feel anything at all. And that's technically not euthanasia because your intention was, like I said, it's the doctrine of double effect. So this situation where somebody is just suffering an intolerable pain and yet there's nothing a palliative care doctor can do about it is not actually correct because they can, like I said, they can treat the symptoms with increasing levels of morphine and all that sort of stuff to the point where they even put that person to sleep so that person does not feel any pain. Now they cannot force medical treatments on somebody. So if somebody says or their family says, you know, well we don't want them to have the feeding tube and all that sort of stuff and then their pain is sedated to the point where they are no longer eating, eventually they will pass away. So it has the cause of hastening the death but like we said, the intention is not about killing them, it's about relieving that pain and relieving that suffering. Now if someone is not terminally ill and they may just be disabled, they may just be depressed, if we allow assisted suicide or if we allow euthanasia, what is the message that that is sending to society? Right? Well then that's, that's saying that 
that there is a certain point in time where your life no longer has any value. So it's an in inconsistent message that society would say, well, you shouldn't kill yourself when you're young. But then when you're old, there's a point in your life, you know, whether you're disabled or you have a condition, that it's no longer worth living. And they say, you know, you know this, this is going to send a, they'll say this is going to send a mixed message. You know, that we're basically affirming to somebody. When somebody asks to die, they're saying, well, this is somebody reaching out and saying, is my life still worth living? And if you say it's okay to die, you're affirming the fact that there is some arbitrary point where life is no longer valuable, which is not the case, of course, according to the Bible. So if somebody's life is not worth living at this side of the spectrum, at this time of life, then why is a disabled person's life worth living if you know, they can't take care of themselves and all that sort of stuff? So most people would not be consistent in that area. Now, the second last one I'm going to talk about is people will say, well, we allow people to put down their pets out of mercy. Why don't we extend that same mercy to humans? Now, here's a few thoughts around that. One is, well, we're making the assumption that people's, people value the lives of animals like they value the lives of humans. Because when people say, well, you, you, can, you, you, you can put your pet down, why can't you put a human down? The assumption in that question is that the life of an animal is the same as the life of a human, which is not correct, right? An animal's life is not the same as the life of a human. And we know that because we eat meat, right? We eat chicken, we eat cows, we eat animals' lives. Now, can, can an animal's life bring joy to a human's life? They can. And people, you know, develop an affinity to animals. But that doesn't mean that taking the life of an animal is the same as taking the life of a human. So we're not arguing that an animal life is the same as a human life. We kill and eat animals all the time. So, but if an animal's life, think about it, if an animal's life was equal to the life of a human, then it would be wrong to euthanize the animal too. Right? So it would be wrong to murder the animal, just like it's wrong to murder the human. But the reason why we don't call that murder is because we don't consider the life of an animal the same as the life of a human. Now, some people may put down their animal because they see it as an act of mercy. But when I think of why would you put an animal down, like if you had a beloved pet that was suffering, and you say, you know, I'm going to put it down, I'm going to put it out of its misery. Well, you do that because... You, you no longer believe that the cost of keeping that animal alive is worth the pleasure that that animal brings you. That's, that's pretty much what it comes down to. Because if, if that animal's life was important to you, then you would do whatever it takes to keep that animal alive, to enjoy its life. But the reason why people put their pets down is because they no longer want to spend the endless money keeping that animal alive, right? And, and relieving it of its pain. Because the same principles would apply with an animal to a human in the sense that a, a veterinarian could ease the suffering of that animal until the point of death and yet it is not active euthanasia, right? It's not it putting um, that animal's life away intentionally. Now just, just in conclusion, I just got, just want to sort of summarize what I'm talking about. Now I hope some of the objections I brought up gave you some thoughts around that, but this is the argument that goes back and forth. Now the crux of the matter for a believer is basically, is taking the life of somebody, whether they give you consent or not, murder? If it is murder, then that's why assisted suicide is wrong for the believer. Now for the, for the non-believer though, you know, when you're arguing it, at, at, about it for the sake of public policy, this is where the arguments come into play and it's about testing people's consistency. It's about you know, you, you can, if somebody's making an argument for assisted, euth uh, assisted suicide or euthanasia and they're not being internally consistent, that is one way that you can, you can debunk their argument. But if the person believes they have a right, you know, and if they give consent, they're allowed to die, which is, what, which is how they would have to justify euthanasia or assisted suicide, then the argument in the public sphere is about, well, what benefit or detriment will it have to society? Does that make sense? So if, because you can't obviously force a non-believer to have the same principle as you when making an argument. It's because we are assuming, you know, our principle is, no matter if you have consent, it's still murder. Therefore, 
assisted suicide and euthanasia is wrong in every instance. But if somebody doesn't hold to that principle, this is why when you hear the euthanasia argument, it's all about the effect on society and it's a, the way up of people that have the right, they believe have the right to take their own life and receive assistance versus the lives that will be lost through coercion and things, the effect of allowing this practice in a society. The innocent people that do not want their life to be taken being caught up in that change in social values. So what are some of the coercive pressures that are out there that people don't necessarily consider when thinking about legalizing assisted suicide? Well, think about these things. One thing is, you know, carer fatigue. You know, people just give up in taking care of somebody and they start thinking, oh, maybe death would be better for all of us, right? That's one um, uh, pressure. Another pressure is the person who is requiring the care, feeling a sense of burden. Like they, they don't want to be a burden to other people. And they think, oh, you know, if I just go, then I, I'm, you know, be better off for everybody. So you, you can see how there are, there, there are these real pressures there that if society gives the green light to euthanasia, that it will encourage that sort of behavior. And it's very hard to catch. And that's why when it comes to public policy, is it, you know, making it hard for somebody to commit suicide or making it too easy to coerce somebody into taking their life that would not otherwise have taken their life in a different society. Then you have people that have like de depression and despair. See, it's, it's very hard sometimes to, to get the consent of somebody because you don't know always all these coercive pressures that are taking place. When somebody says, yes, I'm going to die, they might tell you, oh, I'm making this choice, but how do you know they're not making that choice because they don't want to be a burden? You know, they're depressed and they're thinking their life has no meaning and all that sort of stuff. You know, how do you talk them out of it? It just makes it a lot more difficult. Then you have the financial aspect as well. You have the cost. The cost of palliative health care is a lot higher than killing somebody, right? Than giving them a, a dose of Nebutol or, or injecting them with a lethal drug. So two aspects there when it comes to the financial incentives is one is you will have family members who will look at their elderly parent getting palliative care and thinking that's my inheritance going down the drain. And that happens, right? That they would rather hasten the death because it means they get a higher payout, right? Because think that your palliative care, sometimes if it's not covered by Medicare, will come out of your estate, right? So as you keep keeping alive and keeping alive and that palliative health care can be very expensive, that can drain that bank account and you can have children thinking, I'm going to inherit less. Um, and not only that, like it means doctors may give up easier as well, you know, because it's a lot easier to, to take that route. So a few, few last thoughts. Since, so since death, in my mind, since death is an ultimatum, I think the risk of cutting life short far outweighs the risk of possibly prolonging somebody's life. Right, because somebody who, especially when prognosis are, are so inaccurate, you know, when somebody says you have three life, three months to live, six months to live, those prognoses, there's no way that that is accurate. There's many stories where people are given three months to live, five months to live, and then they go on to live years. There's, there's one story that this Baroness in the debate I posted on in the, in the Facebook group, she says she treated this man, the prognosis he was given was three months or something. And then she talked him out of it. Said, you know, there's something we can do, ease the pain. So he decided not to take his own life. He then ended up living another 23 years. He actually outlived his wife. Right? He was able to see his children grow up. You know, so you, you think about it, right? Like if, if you have a terminally ill and your child is like one year old, just living three years more, you'll see your child speak. You'll see, so, so time can, can, can alter what people experience in their life completely different. So those who wish to die, if you think about it, they eventually will. And they have somewhat control over the time at which they go because like, it's, like we talked about, the law can only stop you to a certain extent. But those who didn't want to die, 
will have their life unnecessarily cut short due to these societal pressures, right? These coercive pressures. And they may lose potential experiences that they can never regain. So, you know, sure, life isn't perfect and some have it harder than others. We definitely ag admit to that. Um, but God wants us to value life. It's a precious thing, which is why murder is such a serious thing. And this is why I believe euthanasia should not be legal. So I hope that gives you a bit more rounding on the argument. Hopefully that gives you some things to think about. Um, and um, yeah, thank you um, for, for listening. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. Thank you that we can learn a bit more about suicide. It's not exactly a positive topic, Lord, but it's something that's very important. And it, it is a fight that will be coming to this society soon, Lord, um, with attempts to legalize euthanasia. I just pray, Lord, that you help us to value life, value life even the way you value life, Lord, that even when consent is given to take a person's life, that society should not sanction this act. So help us, Lord, to argue against um, you know, the secular views that are out there. And I just pray, Lord, that this sermon, uh, I know is a lot of scattered thoughts, Lord, but I hope it just gives people um, some ideas on how they may combat and object to a lot of the objections out there to keeping euthanasia illegal. So thank you, Lord. We just pray that you bless the rest of our time together. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.